Welcome. I can't imagine a better setup for what I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about today uh, than the words that Judge Gray just shared with us um, and the reality that we really do need to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, and that's why uh, I have decided to start us off today with what I hope is a bold idea that you'll take home and move with me. And that's the idea that it is time to make readiness a right. Now, those of you who know me know that we have been talking about Ready by 21 for a long time. We're here at the national meeting. You're here because you believe in the vision of all youth ready for college, work, and life. You're here because you like the big picture approach that we bring that challenges that vision, because you've worked with our staff, you've read the blogs, you've read the reports, you use our actionable data tools, you've worked with the Weikert Center and done assessments, you've been part of our trainings, our institutes, our projects, and equally important, you're here because you like the people in this room. You like being a part of this wonderful and diverse family. So we're here because we really do believe all young people can be ready for college, work, and life. But you're also here because you know, just as I know, that while progress is being made, more can be done. Each year, there are more opportunities and there are more reasons to be both optimistic and outraged. We have opportunities like the Collective Impact Movement, which caught us by storm a couple years ago, but has really gotten communities invigorated about making change at scale, about having an impact, about not just being complacent to say we're trying, but really developing a sense of shared accountability and a shared vision and saying we are going to move the needle and we're gonna publicly begin to measure what matters. We're here because we've got things like My Brother's Keeper that's moving communities across the country to really lift up what's important to make sure that young people, young men in particular, are getting the resources that they need so that prison is not the option, as Judge Bray said. You're here because there are challenges like Ferguson that are ripping this country apart. You're here because there are threats. There are threats in Congress. Threats to programs like 21st Century, which has allowed many of you to start after school, strong after school systems in your community. So we know why you're here. So I've been thinking, as I was getting ready to come up to talk to you, about these opportunities and these challenges. What is it that really matters? Just as Judge Gray said, we want young people to be ready, but what is it that really matters? And I've been thinking about this a lot over the past year, is I became a grandmother for the first time. This is Theo. I'm not biased. Isn't that the cutest baby you've ever <laughs> seen, really? And when you have grandchildren, as I now do, you start to think, what is going to become of this young man? Now, Theo was born eight miles from Ferguson. Now, his, his, pam, his family moved to St. Louis. He was born in St. Louis. His parents are both doctors. My daughter is a pediatrician, a pediatric pulmonologist. Her husband is an ER doctor. They both live in the university area. They live in a wonderful neighborhood. But they're eight miles from Ferguson. And so as I thought about that, and I was with them in September, when things were really unfolding in that community, these two words started to come to mind for me. Yes, readiness. You'd be surprised if we didn't talk about readiness. But the other word, equity. And what does it mean when we put those two words together? What does it mean when we put those two words together? How can we, as the forum, do a better job of not only promoting, equity, promoting readiness, but promoting equity? What can I do as an African-American woman who's the leader of a well-respected organization, the grandmother, many would say, the grandmother of youth development. So I'm a grandmother of Theo, I'm a grandmother of youth development. 
We have always had a focus on disadvantaged and disconnected youth at this organization, but this focus was implicit, not explicit. It certainly wasn't strident. It was evident in the choices that we made about what to write, where to work, whom to work with. It was certainly aided by the seven years that I spent at the Children's Defense Fund with Mary Ann Wright Edelman. Now, I have intentionally advanced this idea of readiness as a universal goal over the course of my career because I felt that it was a stronger position from which to argue and counter the tendency of those that have the signing pen who want to think about stingier, substandard goals for those kids than for their kids. And so figuring out how to talk in universal terms, how to talk about problem free isn't fully prepared, how to talk about academic competence while critical is not enough. Those were important things that I wanted to advance and advancing them from a universal position made sense. But I have to say that while my work and those comments, and in some cases my race has gotten me seats at tables that are important seats, increasingly as those tables are talking about equity, we have to figure out, I have to figure out how to be stronger and more vocal about what we mean. How do we make sure that equity is a part of this conversation? So these words, thank you. So these words, equity and readiness, I have really been struggling to say, how do we bring them together? How do we bring them together so that this can be a more visible part of the solution? Because readiness is not just a universal goal. We have got to position readiness as one of the toughest civil rights issues of our time. And we have to do this for exactly the reasons that Judge Gray said. So I want to take my time with you today to make sure that you understand what I've been thinking about, how I want to get this work started. Let me start that by putting that map back up on the screen. I think there is a serious problem. I'm going to put this back where I was. Hang on a second. I think we have a serious problem in this country if we let the conversations about equity and readiness happen in different places. Now the conversation that's happening in Ferguson is an important conversation about equity, about equal treatment, about making sure that young people and young men and all the folks in Ferguson have the right to be safe on their streets, they have the right to exercise their voices, those are important and critical conversations. But we've got to figure out how those conversations don't stop there, while the conversations eight miles away are conversations about making sure young people are ready for college. They are ready for the best jobs. They are ready for the lives that replace the people in this room. We've got to make sure that we're having these conversations. And so problem free, while important, is not fully prepared. And readiness is about being prepared. Ready for what has to be the question. Readiness is about being prepared. And I want to make sure that the young people in Ferguson are not just problem free. I want to make sure they are fully prepared. And that means that we have to think differently about readiness. Now, I coined the term problem free isn't fully prepared when I was at the Children's Defense Fund back in the 80s. And I left the Children's Defense Fund in 1990 to set up the Center for Youth Development and Policy Research with Michelle Cahill, who's in the room here somewhere and has joined us at this meeting, and I'm so delighted that we have her. I left because I didn't think at that point in time, the Children's Defense Fund was doing enough to make sure young people were fully prepared. We had an agenda that was aggressively about problem-free, or at least reducing problems, making sure young people were safe from abuse, 
making sure young people were safe from neglect, making sure young people had the social services they needed, making sure young people had access to schools. But we weren't working on quality. We weren't working on the issues to make sure that young people really could be fully prepared. So I left and I started the Center for Youth Development and, and Policy Research with Michelle and life goes on from there and the youth development work got started. And youth development is an idea that while it's not fully realized, it is at least now visible in public policy. It's not just visible in your programs. But we have to believe that if public progress, if we allow public progress in Ferguson to be measured only in terms of equity, while parental progress eight miles away in the Central West End and in the University District is measured in terms of readiness, we've got to believe that the distance between those two communities is going to be much, much bigger than eight miles. We have got to believe that we are not going to span that short stretch if we don't figure out how to talk about readiness and equity in a different way. And so I want to talk to you about, I've been thinking again about how we do that. So I want to take a minute to talk to you about why I believe that what we need to do is not continue to talk about equity in the pursuit of readiness, but talk about readiness in the pursuit of equity. And I'm not just switching words around here. I think this really is an important concept. 15 years ago, the forum merged with an organization called Community Impact. They started in DC and they had then opened up small nonprofit organizations in Nashville, in Austin, and in Baltimore. Uh, and they came to us to be their evaluators. Uh, and as we talked to them, it was also clear that there were some serious flaws in the business model. It, wasn't, it didn't probably make sense to set up these tiny little nonprofits, but the ideas that they had were extremely important. And the idea was to mobilize young people. They were called youth mobilizers. In each, young, in each community, they hired 8, 10, 12 young people who were trained to do research in their community, they were trained to understand what was going on in their community, and they started with deep conversations like the conversations Judge Gray has with her young people, deep conversations about what for them readiness meant. So that when they looked around their community, they were looking for what the barriers and opportunities to readiness were in East Nashville. Let's talk about Nashville. But they sat first as a group of young people starting in the summer, talking to themselves, talking with adults, answering the questions, not just what do you want to be, but what is it going to take for you to get there? And who's helping you? And where are they? And what else do you need? And what are the barriers that you're worried about? And then having the research tools to document those barriers, and then talking to adults in the community, talking to adults at City Hall, talking to the superintendents, talking about what they needed to be ready and what they thought it was within the means of, their, of themselves and their peers and their families and the adults in their community to fix so that they could do the things they wanted to do as well as their peers. This was an empowerment model that started with young people, naming what needed to happen for them. And so I've been thinking a lot about that because what happened in Nashville was that we started with the idea of readiness and that idea of readiness allowed them to move very nimbly in pursuit of equity in ways that mattered in that community and in ways that were manageable and changeable in that community. So that when the young people of Nashville who were the youth mobilizers realized that one of the things that they needed to do to pursue their dreams was to start saving money. Right? They were from low-income families. Their parents weren't going to be able to afford to send them to college. 
And so the program set up individual development accounts so that as they worked and they worked in their communities, and they got folks to put money into that bank account for them, and they put money in from their stipends, and then they realized they didn't know a lot about managing money. So they added a financial literacy course. And then they found that once they understood more about financial literacy, they figured out their parents didn't know a lot about saving money. And in fact, their parents were going to check cashing places that charged exorbitant interest rates. And so they got angry with that. And they said, this isn't helping. This isn't helping our parents help us. This isn't helping our neighborhoods. We're going to close these places down. We're going to go in town and find out why the banks aren't, that are in Nashville are not in East Nashville. We're going to go talk to those folks. We're going to get the facts. We're going to put them together. We're going to do that. And they did. Four years later, they had the first credit union back in East Nashville. They had the mayor taking aggressive action to get the check cashing places out of their neighborhoods. And they were training their parents. They were going to the public housing projects. They were going to community centers. They were running financial literacy classes for their parents and their families. Young people were doing this. They did more research. They found that the earned income tax credit wasn't being well used. They organized. They worked with their United Way. They got more people enrolled in the earned income tax credit than had ever been enrolled in East Nashville in their previous history. Young people did that. Then they said, we should be going to college. They did their homework. They found that only one in 10 of the freshmen in East Nashville, in East Nashville even applied to college. They started talking to young people, and they asked why. This college access question was fine, and people were telling them, well, maybe they don't know about financial aid, and maybe they don't know what kind of colleges are available. But they started talking to young people. And they figured out there were lots of reasons why young people weren't going to college. One was that the counselors were preemptively deciding who was college material, and they weren't even talking to college, talking about college to a lot of young people. Young people that they thought were interested, but they weren't getting any information from the college counselors. So they collected that information. They did a survey of students. They took that to the principal. Then they realized that one of the barriers was their families that very often their families, while on the one hand excited about the fact that they might go to college, were concerned about losing income, were concerned about them moving away from home. They realized that it wasn't just skill sets that they needed to go to college. They needed to change mindsets of their peers and their families. They started working on that. They created something called College on the Brain. They, they created this first study looking at college access inside out, meaning let's start with understanding the reasons we have for not going to college before we go ask people for financial aid and other things. Young people did this. And I, I could tell you more stories, but we want to keep going here. But I just wanted to let you know that I've been thinking back to where the forum made our first merger. And we did that because at that point, we had an advisory board of wonderful people like Peter Edelman, Mary Wright Edelman's husband, and uh, a civil rights lawyer and advocate in his own right. And they basically told us at that point we were a traditional think tank. Right? We wrote policy reports. We did research synthesis. Uh, we did keynote speeches. We put ideas out there like problem-free and fully prepared. We were very good synthesizers and developers of ideas. But our board said to us, and us is Marita Irby, co-founder of the forum, who has been with me, and she will tell you the number, 21 years, 22 days, some number like that. She has a count, one of those count things that's on her desk. Um, they said, get focused, get grounded, get results. And so the first thing that we did in that, to sort of solving that mandate of get focused, get grounded, get results, was to take advantage of the fact that Community Impact, this wonderful program, had come to us to figure out how to document and evaluate what they did. And so we ended up merging with them. And that those four communities became our first, in some ways, Ready by 21 communities, where we began to understand what does it take to really help young people 
be a part of the solution, what does it take to get much more specific, much more nuanced information about what the barriers to readiness are so that we can actually work on them together? Now, form has grown along the way. That was the first merger, but it wasn't the last. There was something called Connect for Kids that was doing an amazing job of making sure that people in this country who cared about kids were getting comprehensive information they could act on as advocates um, with Congress, uh, nationally uh, and federally and locally. It's now called Spark Action. We started working with the National Governors Association and the National Conference of State Legislatures to bring together children's cabinets in, in any given time, about half the states have some kind of children's cabinet network, sometimes focused on early childhood, et cetera. And no one was bringing them together. And these were powerful potential opportunities for us to make the kind of changes that we need to have by aligning public dollars and public services. And so we manage and continue to manage the children's cabinet network. The Center for Youth Program Quality came about when we partnered with High Scope Educational Research Foundation to again get grounded, get focused, get results. And one of those results that we cared passionately about was quality. How do we not just make sure young people are in programs, but how do we make sure they're in quality programs? So we started to partner with, with High Scope, and that ended up, ended up with the Weikert Center being a part of the forum family. Community Systems Group, when we looked around for the best folks in the country who had, not, who had been doing this collective impact work before it was called collective impact, and it figured out how you can help coalitions actually do shared measurement and evaluate their goals and see if they're making a difference, what their contributions are to collective impact, we started partnering with the community systems group. All that was a part of that Ready by 21 partnership that was started, that brought United Way, uh, the School Superintendents Association with us, with many others. And then finally, we joined the Collective Impact Forum once it was clear that this Collective Impact language was going to take on and going to stay with us. So we're an important partner in that with FSG. Lots of partnerships. This has to be about partnerships, and the center does those. But what I want to spend my remaining time talking to you about is what we've been focused on over the past year and a half. And Stephanie Krause, who's in the audience somewhere, um, over there in the corner, has joined us from uh, recently running a charter school, a, a, a competency-based charter school in St. Louis. And she's joined us and has been sort of joined at the hip with me for better or worse, um, uh, and with Caitlin Johnson, who runs Spark Action and is home with her newborn, uh, so not with us today. We started this thing called the Readiness Project very quietly because we wanted to figure out how to get sharper, better ammunition around this readiness and equity idea. Because what we know, and this is just reminding us what we know, we know that too few young adults are doing well. We know that. Now, for the past 10 years plus, we've been using, and you all, many of you know this if you know the forum, we've been using Michelle Gambone's work, the meta-analysis that she did looking at studies of young, longitudinal studies of young people from early adolescence into early adulthood. So put all those studies together, and you ask the question, how well are young people doing in three categories? Are they productive? And that meant, depending on where they were developmentally, are they in school? Are they working? Are they productive? Are they healthy? Do they have healthy habits, healthy behaviors, avoiding risky behaviors? And are they connected? Right? Are they connected to their community? Are they connected in some positive way to the faith community, et cetera? Or are they disconnected to the point that they're doing illegal activity? Three big basic questions that hung together as a definition of readiness that most parents would, would buy into. Yet we, what she found, that really only four out of 10 young people were doing well by that definition of productive, healthy, and connected as young adults. Only four in 10 were doing well, and two in 10 were in deep trouble. They were in deep trouble. They were what we would now call disconnected or opportunity youth. They were in deep trouble. What they also found by doing this analysis, which was so important, and so important for this conversation, was that if you adjusted what kind of supports young people had, theoretically, you could change those numbers. You could change the odds 
from four in 10 young people doing well to seven in 10 young people doing well. How do you do that? Well, at the same time that this meta-analysis was happening, the National Research Council put out their report, Community Programs to Promote Youth Development. And what you saw there was them defining the characteristics of the good, what, a, what a good developmentally appropriate place looks like for young people, where they're gonna spend their time. That it has to be physically and psychologically safe, it has to have appropriate structure, it's got to have supportive relationships. The Search Institute is now really focused on developmental relationships. It's gotta have supportive relationships, give young people opportunities to belong, establish positive social norms, support efficacy and mattering, that fact that young people can feel that they make a difference, clearly provide opportunities for skill building and integrate across family, school, and community so that young people don't feel a sense of disjuncture as they move between these important systems. Now that's the National Research Council. The National Academy of Sciences gave us the language to validate what it is that we know is important about the places where kids spend their time. And they basically also told us that when those things go way off, we do harm to young people. It's not just that these things are important, when they're not there, when they are not there, we can potentially do harm to young people. So, the Gambone folks looked at supportive relationships, they looked at challenging experiences, and what they found was that, again, using statistical analysis to look across all these different studies, the question was, if young people had had supportive relationships consistently, from their early adolescent years on through, would it have made a difference? And the answer was absolutely. They found that young people who had supportive relationships in high school were five times more likely to leave high school ready than with weak relationships. Leaving high school ready didn't just mean leaving with a diploma. It meant leaving with a plan. It meant leaving with the skills that you needed to execute that plan and meant leaving with a sense that there were some adults that you could connect to that were gonna help you execute that plan. Leaving ready didn't just mean a piece of paper. And young people who had supportive relationships were five times more likely to leave ready. Now what happened to those young people who left ready? Well, that continued to make a difference. Young people who left high school ready were then four times as likely to be doing well as young adults as those who didn't. So it carried through. So again, the message and why we've used this research consistently for more than a decade, the message is that practices matter. When we do what feels like simple things of providing young people with consistent, supportive relationships, we make a huge difference in their lives. So let's fast forward from that information and talk about this first idea that I want to put on the table that gets us to readiness in pursuit of equity. You know Ready by 21, you know what I'm about to build. It's the readiness target. We are all focused on making sure young people are academically and vocationally productive. We have lots of data in our communities that we track about whether young people are physically and emotionally healthy and safe, mostly on the physically healthy and safe and if they're avoiding risky behaviors. What we don't have in the middle is enough information about whether young people really are socially competent and civically connected. All right? So we've got lots of data on risky behaviors. We know whether young people are neglected. We know whether they're abused. We know whether they're in the juvenile justice system. We know if they're pregnant. We know if they're using substances. We got that. What we don't have is a good handle on the middle, even though all the research tells us that when young people have those social emotional skills, those non-cognitive skills, those non-academic competencies, they are better able to be successful academically and vocationally, and they are better able to avoid or manage risky circumstances. We know that that's a power space, that middle ring, but we don't do enough with it. So let me talk about and share the images of what we're trying to do with this readiness project. Because it's really a project to build sharper tools for us as the forum and for you as our partners to carry these ideas forward. So let's start with this idea of a young person with a backpack. 
I mean, we can call it a super pack. In that pack are these abilities that that young person needs to carry around with them to be ready for whatever challenges and opportunities come next. And we can say that these abilities add up to a sense of agency. There's a growing language about what it means. But the idea is, if we've done it well enough, young people have that sense of problem solving skills, they've got communication skills, they've got time management skills, they've got a growth mindset, you know the language that's coming out. They've got those things, not sort of checked off as a list, but they've integrated them together into a sense of self and a sense of identity that gives them a sense of agency that they can go into a system or setting and do what's expected of them or do what they need to do. That's what happens when that backpack is filled. Now, fill that backpack and they go into all those different systems and settings. You can name them. Some of them are places that we want them to go, like community college or training schools or a four-year college or employment. Some of them are places we would like them not to go, like the juvenile justice system. But they are the places where, where young people find themselves. They are the places where young people spend their time. And the question that we have to ask, if we're going to tackle serious inequities that are in all of those places where young people spend their time, is how do we begin to use the idea of readiness? How do we sharpen this tool of readiness so that we can tackle inequities where we find them? So let me tell you what Stephanie did. And I think immediately following my keynote, there's a workshop, is that true, Stephanie? In which Stephanie's gonna unbundle all this for you. So I'm just giving you the preview and telling you the amazing work that happened. That when I charged Stephanie, who had done this brilliant work to set up a competency-based school, I said, what would happen if we looked across all of those places where kids spend their time and asked, what are the frameworks in place? What are the, what are the things that those places are saying young people need to have? So I know the language isn't going to match. I know it's going to be uneven. But can we dig into the research and the practice literatures in each of those, in child welfare, in juvenile justice, in higher education, in health promotion and prevention, in civic engagement? And can we find the language that people are using to talk about the skill sets and mindsets that young people need to have to be successful at the big outcomes that those systems want. And so Stephanie took six months and has an incredible mind and memory, pull all that together, and then developed this core set of 10 abilities which sit at the middle of all of those places. These are the things that need to be in the backpack. And then we went back and forth with the Spark Action team, with the communication team, to name them in ways that are youth-centered, that young people understand, and that, frankly, we can understand, so that we can have a conversation with young people in our communities, an updated conversation like the conversation that we had in Nashville, which got those youth mobilizers understanding the skills they needed to build to change their institutions talk to their families, and change their community. That's what this list is a starter list of. So don't consider it finished. Consider it a down payment. Learn more about it. You're going to have a lot of time to do that. So why am I excited about this? I'm excited about it for the same reason that 10 years ago we started a quality conversation, because there is enough research that we can know that whatever we decide to call them, and we don't have to call them readiness abilities. I'm just going to plead with you that sometime in the near future, we start calling them by what they are, and we stop calling them what they aren't. These are not non-cognitive, non-academic skills. They're not soft skills versus hard skills. This backpack is full of the most important things young people need to have if they're going to have agency and they deserve their own name because they matter, because they are measurable. Now we're going to have to come back and be careful in their workshops that Charles and his team and others are going to show uh, have today uh, and tomorrow to make sure that we're not going down the track 
of measuring these things in a way that disempower young people and suggest that the only way you get these abilities is if, if somebody with a credential teaches them to you. So let's be careful on measurement, but let's understand that they are at least observable and nameable. They are malleable. This is the hidden solution to equity because young people can build these skills. Young people are building these skills. Young people often have these skills and don't know that they matter because nobody's named them for them. Young people may have built these skills and applied them in the wrong place because they were in a gang, but you can help them move them and translate them and apply them in ways that are gonna help them advance and understand that they have agency and just as quality, we've demonstrated that quality is marketable, that people like you with limited resources but a deep commitment to doing better are willing to find the money to engage with organizations like the Weikert Center, like NIOST, like the Forum, like lots of us, who are willing to help you have the tools and the resources and the networks and the training to do better. This is marketable. So what are we gonna do with it? Let's go to idea two, quality. Anybody in the room that's talked to the Weikert Center knows the quality pyramid. That quality pyramid built directly off of the National Research Council work is consistent with it. This is Maslow's needs hierarchy. We know what this work is. But let's talk about the fact that if we are going to make a difference in young people's lives, if we are going to have a conversation about readiness and equity, it has to get out of the after school space. We've got to get this conversation going across all of the places where young people spend their time. Because we have to make sure that we're doing no harm as communities to young people. When we make young people spend time in places that don't pay attention to these important developmental practices, we do harm. How many studies do we need of young people telling us this, that that's why they left? That's why they tuned out, that's why they dropped out, that's why they ran away from their foster care home or their group home. How much time and studies do we need to have to understand that if we don't name these practices and not just selfishly claim them as the purview of after school and out of school programs, but name them as the rights that young people have in any place where they spend time, we are doing a disservice to young people and we will not advance the cause of equity. Let's look at the Weikert model because the quest for readiness begins with a good theory of change, and we have a good theory of change. So that idea of quality leading to engagement is a big one. And the Weikert Center with the Youth Program Quality Assessment has been focused on that like a laser from, for a decade. Because engagement is what gets you those social emotional skills and beliefs. And once you have those sufficiently packed in your backpack, you can transfer those skills to achievement behavior or any other behavior that someone wants you to have if you've had sufficient time to practice and space to practice those skills until they stick, until they're yours, until you're confident enough in them that they can move. So we know we have to have that, right? But that picture has been developed and used very successfully in the after school space. So again, I turned to Stephanie and I said, look across the other literatures, education, child welfare, juvenile justice, look at the flip side. You've made the list of the abilities that they said young people needed to have, the skill sets and mindsets. Let's look at the list of practices. Now I know this is too small to see, we'll give it to you. The Readiness Project website is up and this will be up on it. You can tap into it immediately after. But when we looked at those lists, what you ended up with were lists that sorted into four categories. Statements about environments, 
statements about the people, statements about the experiences that young people wanted to have, and statements about how to organize space and time so young people can do whatever they need to do that we're calling engagement. Right? Lots of different words, lots of different phrases. The list that we pulled together isn't perfect. We're calling these universal lists not because everybody does everything, but because we tried to make sure everything we found was included somewhere in these lists so we could really have an important conversation. Now, I'm going to try this idea on you. And literally, nobody in the room has even seen this idea before. I made it up last night. So if it doesn't work, <laughs> but this is where I think we have to go. I think we are ready to make readiness a right. I think we are ready to talk about this across systems. I think the people in this room are the right people to be able to do this. And this is why. Because we have done an incredible job in the after school, out of school youth development space. We have made enormous strides in defining those developmental practices that create a quality environment for young people regardless of the content we're trying to convey. But what we haven't done yet, and, we, and we've been able to do that, honestly, because after school and out of school, as Charles would say, can afford to be a social movement because we aren't restricted by a lot of official practices telling us this is how you have to do it. But what I want us to understand is that those same words, environments, and that's really that point of service environment, where the magic happens between adults and children. That every setting where young people spend their time also has official practices related to how they describe what that environment needs to look like. Now, it may need to look like lockdown. What those people need to look like. They may need to look like probation officers who have more training in control than in youth development. What those experiences need to look like. Those experiences may need to look like being in isolation. The official practices that go along with the systems where young people spend their time have not been scrubbed to see if they do harm because they're in absolute opposition to the developmental practices we know have to be there. Does that make sense? And so we cannot continue, we have to continue to do the research, to do what Charles talked about. What are your three Ps, Charles? Position, what's your second one? Position, performance, proof. We have to continue to use the fact that after school and out of school and youth development programs are the places where because we've made the commitment to those readiness abilities. We've made the commitment to these readiness practices, and we're ready to position this better. We're ready to measure ourselves in performance uh, management uh, and in performance improvement, and we're really ready on our terms to come back and have those rigorous evaluation studies that allow us to prove that these practices and these abilities matter. We're going to do it on our terms, but we need to be clear. We are doing this for young people. We are doing this for our communities. We are doing this to push a conversation with every system where young people spend their time so that we can basically say, what happens when the official doesn't include the developmental? What happens when because we haven't been positioning this well enough and broadly enough. We haven't been engaged in sufficient conversation with folks who were building performance management standards and practices for other systems. What happens when the official doesn't include the developmental? Well, we know one of the things that happens. The Gallup poll documents it every year. Engagement declines steadily in school. For every year young people are in school, they get less and less engaged until at grade 10 when they drop out. And so the folks who are left go up a little bit, mostly because they're getting ready to leave. So not an indictment of school. This can happen anywhere. This can happen in any system. This is the kind of thing that happens when we don't have rigorous and active ways to have a conversation not about 
let your young people come over here and develop these abilities and then come into your school and use the abilities in defense of being bored to death. It's really about how do we bring this conversation into every place where young people spend their time so that it can be integrated and we have an opportunity to address the traps that happen when we only look at official practices and we don't pay attention to the developmental ones and young people end up bored or even in toxic environments, to address the gaps that happen when because young people don't build those readiness abilities, they aren't able to deliver against the broader outcomes that the system wants to have. And so what does the system do? It cracks down and gets even more constrictive or restrictive in those official practices, trying to force young people to get to outcomes that they would get to on their own if we opened up the developmental space for them. So we have been creating these maps so that we can go home and have conversations in our communities, not just with ourselves, we have to continue with ourselves, but with all of the places, all of the settings where young people spend their time. That includes families, that includes neighborhoods. This certainly starts with systems, but it doesn't end with systems. You can bring your neighborhood planning councils together and they can talk about what they need to do if neighborhoods are not safe. We can have conversations, but we have to figure out how to do no harm. We have to figure out how to shine a spotlight on everything that's going on in the places where young people spend their time because if they come in there with a sense of agency and it's a boring or toxic place, they can get through. They can manage to get through and come out the other end with the outcomes that you want. But what we want is for those places not to be boring and toxic. We don't want the burden for developing that sense of agency to just be on the after school community. We have got to figure out how to do this. And so, to get back to collective impact and to get us out of here, when we talk about community change management, when we talk about communities coming together to set goals, at complex, to solve complex problems at scale and set goals and take shape, we've got to make sure we've got the right people around the table. When we talk about taking aim, we cannot let these conversations continue to be reduced to conversations about graduation rates and pregnancy rates and recidivism rates. We've got to have a way to keep this conversation going about readiness while we're building the observable measures to do it. When we take stock, we have got to get young people involved so that you get the nuanced taking stock that happened in East Nashville. We get the real picture of what's happening inside of the places where young people are spending time, and we get that visible. And that can be neighborhoods, that can be families, that can be systems. We have to do that. So that when we target action, we are targeting making changes in things that matter in ways that young people will see them and feel them immediately and make this more equitable. We can't do it up here at the big sense. When we start to talk about we're gonna change poverty, et cetera, those are important goals. But those young people in Nashville made their lives better for them and their peers within a matter of years because they pinpointed practices that needed to be changed and that were malleable if we put a spotlight on them. And then we have to come have a completely different way of tracking progress that allows us to have much, much more background data behind what we're doing so that we're not just focusing on youth outcomes, but we are getting this kind of laser focus on what's happening in the places where young people spend their time. And so I want us to think about pursuing equity by making readiness a right. I want us to think about helping young people build the sense of agency that they need to not only navigate systems and places that sometimes do them harm, but to change them. I want us to do this for young people because we're committed to doing no harm. Thank you.